<clears throat> Recollections of Muhammad Ali. The fact of the matter is that because I'm an artist and a musician and a scientist, inventor and so on and so forth, I've had the opportunity to meet um, many special people, not just rich and famous, but intellectually uh, advanced as well. Um, amongst my memories of the many people that I met who stood out, um, there is Muhammad Ali. I was probably about 13 years old when I first heard of Cassius Clay winning gold in the Olympics and how he came home and the story went that he threw his medal in the river because some guy wouldn't serve um, a hamburger or something like that to him. And he recognized the hypocrisy, the level of corruption and deceit of his own government, his own country, his own countrymen. Muhammad was a, he was a very simple man, very straightforward man. He, uh, well, let, let's, let's go back to the time when I was about 13. This was before he fought Sonny Liston for the first time. He was knocked down twice, but he, uh, he got up and he annihilated his competition. And at that time he was called a Louisville lip because he made brash uh, proposals saying he was the greatest, he was the prettiest. And the fact of the matter is, uh, he was a very unusual character. And I remember uh, betting my brother for the first time. Uh, I had Sonny Liston, my brother had Cassius Clay. And even though I had this feeling that I was going to lose, just to make it interesting, I still took Liston. And he wound up on his back from a phantom punch. And it was so interesting the way then Cassius Clay, um, AKA Muhammad Ali, was so excited. I mean, his, his uh, brainwaves must have been 30 at least beta. He was so highly sympathetic. He was so fast. He was, he was like a middleweight. Anyway, he captured my interest. His, his character, his personality captured my interest. And when he fought Liston for the second time, I think it was just a given that uh, uh, he would win with that phantom punch. The story went that uh, Liston was afraid for his life because he was threatened. The fact of the matter is that uh, Cassius Clay was a superior athlete. And then he became Muhammad Ali. And he became Muhammad Ali because, because of the uh, deceit in which he grew up. And he distrusted Christianity, the white man's religion and turn to um, Islam. It just made sense that he did that because, um, because of the way he was treated, because he saw how his brothers were treated. He saw the inequity of racism. 
it was very simple to him. And when he became Muhammad Ali, he was incredibly talented. I mean, I remember when he fought Patterson and uh, Ernie Terrell and Zora Foley. But you know, Ali was a good man. I mean, after the Zora Foley fight, he called uh, his wife, Foley's wife, just to let her know that he was okay. He had no interest in hurting anybody, really. He was, uh, he was a performer. And then when they stripped him of his title, and, and so many people were just um, hating him at that time, in the 60s, because they expected him to do what Joe Lewis did, you know, going to the service and just be a good boy, behave, uh, do some exhibitions and so on. But Muhammad was, uh, he, he was a man of his own, of his own making. There wasn't an ounce of deceit in his body. And it, it's not a question of just being deceitful to others. You know, there are certain people who are honest with themselves. You know, they have that, uh, that sense of integrity, that sense of uh, purpose. To be human. And I remember the uh, first time that our paths crossed. It was somewhere around 1970. This was before um, he went back in the ring to fight Jerry Quarry, you know, on his return. Uh, he did a show on, called Buck White on Broadway. And my brother-in-law, Neil Bogart, um, as a matter of fact, invested in that show, half a million dollars at the time. And I was there for the opening. And, you know, you think a Broadway show would be entertaining. Um, but this, this show is edifying. I knew it was going to close very quickly because it was edifying to the point of frightening. There were so many people all over the place yelling, chains they brought us here in chains and when ali came and made his appearance for the first time i saw him in person he was dead serious he had a point to make and he made it and the fact of the matter is you know i loved the man because he was uh, not just unique, but he was just so um, honest, so real. He was exactly the man he purported to be. Years later, 1979, after I made my discovery in the Jacobson equation, uh, I was, as I said before, immediately blacklisted. Um, the power structure was not interested in what I considered to be the cure for cancer. So it made sense for me to go to the Deer Lake training camp. And I brought, you know, one of the paintings that I had done of Ali and Quarry. And at that time, you know, first I met Bundini Brown and then Lana Shabazz, who was his cook. And, and uh, then I met uh, Muhammad. Uh, he was having dinner and I started talking to him. 
And he was leery, you know, because I came in with my wife and my friend and, you know, three white people had the audacity to walk into his kitchen and his dining room and just, you know, sit down and feel like they belong there. <laughs> and it was uh, very interesting, actually. Now, a little bit later, I knocked on his cottage alone. I had a bunch of papers in my hand. And I just knew that if I talked to him and I explained to him that I had made a major discovery and it was being ignored or was being uh, blacklisted or whatever it was, it was being discounted. I knew that he would number one, believe me, and number two, help me. Because he was real. I knew he was real. So I knocked on the door and uh, it was opened by a woman boxer. I forget her name. She was very nice. And Ali was near the fireplace. And he said, uh, come in and, and close the door behind you. So I was in. And I started to explain to Muhammad that I had made this major discovery and that um, I needed help. And I saw the fury in him. Um, he didn't miss a beat. He said, uh, with that energy that he always had, how do I know you're not crazy? And I slumped to the floor, put my papers on the floor, just sat on the floor and just said, because I spent time in the Bronx treating people, poor people, black people, white people, purple people, yellow people, people, people of all races and creeds, of all religions, of all kinds. I went to help the poor. I went to help people. That's how, that's how you know I'm not crazy. And he said, after, after I just responded to his question, he said, now that I believe you, what do we do about it? And he started talking about the lawyers in Chicago. And I said, I, I couldn't even think about it lawyers in Chicago. I was still having trouble at that time with Gorkholm in my eyes. And um, then he said, let me get the title back. He was, he was about to fight Holmes. And he believed he would win. Let me get the title back and we'll work together, Doc. That's what he said. It was natural that we would be friends. It was just natural. And I said, that's cool. And, and as the woman boxer uh, massaged him and rubbed his feet, he was tired. It was, he had come in to, to train for the Holmes fight. And he was, he was out of shape. Um, he just said, keep talking, Doc. And I just kept talking. And it was just days after that, I was watching the Jerry Lewis telethon. And Jerry Lewis started talking about Muhammad Ali, that he wouldn't agree, he wouldn't permit cameras to be brought into the training camp in order to say something to evoke some measure of sympathy, sympathy so that Jerry can raise more money. Jerry Lewis was really angry. And he started to say, when, when we discover the cure, blah, 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 obviously he had heard of me. He had heard of my claims. And he was mad at me and he was mad at Ali. And I knew right then that Ali refused Jerry Lewis promotion because he believed me. 
He believed that the whole power structure was a fake. He believed it. <laughs> he was right in believing it, because it was. It was a fake. Now they talk about fake news. They talk about insanity, politicians. Um, that kind of fakeness, fakery, fraudulence. It's not new. There's nothing new about it at all. They let in what they want in, and they block what they want out. It's as simple as that. Based upon expediency for their own lives, the flow of money and power. It's as simple as that. It's very simple. And Ali knew that. He knew that quite well. Sadly, uh, we were spending some time with Bandini Brown and Lana Shabazz in the village in, in uh, Harlem. And uh, and the fight came. And Ali couldn't sweat after the first round. And I knew that he had been taking uh, pills to lose weight. And when I saw the uh, expression on the face of the doctor who had been prescribing the pills for Ali, I knew that it wasn't just a simple mistake. There was intentionality there. I believe Ali was drugged. I, be I believe Ali would have beat Holmes had he not been drugged, had he taken more time to lose weight naturally and to get back into shape naturally, I believe he would have beat Holmes. And I believe Holmes was a great fighter too, but Ali was the greatest. Well, at any rate, a lot of other things happened after that. And it was very sad and he gained weight and he fought Burbick and he was completely out of shape when he fought him. He was about 250 pounds and he took a terrible beating and i think that's when um, he sustained brain damage to the point where it was irreversible but about five years later um, i had moved to florida and i was uh, president of a foundation dedicated to the eradication of human suffering it was the Perspectivism Foundation. And I had done a painting uh, called Eyes of the World, which was uh, a large number of, you know, little black boys, uh, obviously starving. And I sent it to Ali. And it wasn't long after that, that um, I received a poem from Ali. And I don't remember exactly what it said, but something like, you know, um, good deeds are the uh, rent we pay for our room in the hereafter, something like that. I love Ali and he had a little heart and because uh, he appreciated the painting. I wanted to use the painting to raise money for the purpose. Um, and then he called me and it was a, such a pleasure to receive his call because he was, uh, so real. He simply enjoyed people, people of all kinds. He simply, uh, he was a good man. He was just good. He did things because he felt uh, that they were right. I don't think he had any other reason for doing anything. It's true that when he first started boxing, he was enraged. He was 
angry. He was, he was furious, not just because somebody stole his bike, but because of the inequity and iniquity of his country. I, I remember him saying, uh, why should I go to halfway around the world, you know, to, to kill people when uh, the people in my own country don't treat me right? I don't have anything against those Viet Cong. What about the people in my own country who wouldn't even serve me a hamburger? Anyway, I had a conversation with Ali, I think it was 1985, and it was really a pleasure. Um, I missed him. A lot of other things were going on. And then in the late 90s, uh, I was in uh, Beverly Hills treating an ALS patient, and there was a connection to uh, Ali's fourth wife. And I spoke to her over the phone, and I convinced her to bring Ali to me in Boca Raton. And, uh, you know, in hindsight, I recognized that I didn't know as much about how to treat Parkinson's or high blood pressure then um, as I do now, or as I learned about five years later. Um, at any rate, Lani Ali was a very smart woman, took care of him, obviously loved him, and when they arrived, the media was all over them. I had not called the media. I told everybody uh, that, uh, that it was a secret that I was going to treat him because um, it just made sense that if I was able to help him, then he would help me. If I was not able to help him, then I wouldn't expect him to say anything. But there were, there were um, the media met the plane when they arrived. They knew that we went out to dinner with him. They were storming my office in Boca Raton. And Lonnie was furious. And she said, it's got to be that guy, Frank, my COO. And I asked Frank, I said, did you call the media? I told you not to. And he said, no, he didn't. He denied it. And she said, well, if you're not involved, Jerry, then you'll fire him. And you, you know, she was right. Because as it turned out, even though I believed him at the time or I wasn't sure, I gave him the benefit of the doubt. A year or two after that, I did fire him for stealing from the company when my accountants caught him. But I didn't fire him at that time. And Lonnie took Ali away. And that was very, very sad. And she did the right thing. She was a woman of great class, great class, sensible. She did the right thing, and I was uh, regretful. And I had no idea that it was Frank and all the, also the Levito brothers, other people who were involved with the company, who just decided that, you know, uh, if they let the media know that Ali was there, uh, then the stock price would jump up quickly. They would they would sell, they would make a, a quick bundle, and they didn't care what happened after that. They didn't care what happened to me, they didn't care what happened to my company, my technology, my science, they didn't, they didn't care. And I was, um, I guess, I would have to say that 
um, I was naive. It's more than naive. I think I was just stupid. I should have fired him on the spot. Because it was obvious. It was obvious to her that, uh, that Frank was the one who was doing it. And I was completely innocent, but I took the brunt of the negativity. It was very sad. I only got to treat Ali twice. I didn't uh, know enough at the time anyway. But it really hurt me when he turned to me one day and he said, you're, you're using me. And I said, no, I'm not. And, but he was so straight out, so right out there. He didn't hesitate to just speak his mind. That's what Lonnie told him. Lonnie was right. I wasn't me, it was Frank, but she was right. And it was very sad. That's a very sad memory for me because I so much wanted to help him. And it was um, after I spoke with him for a little while, he, he handed me his stock line. He said, uh, you're not as dumb as you look. He, he said that to a lot of people. And he was a magician. He had this, um, he, he loved to entertain. Anyway. Those were the ups and downs uh, of my life with Muhammad Ali. I think I would leave it uh, with just one notation that I think that Lani Ali is doing a wonderful job for his memory. And I, for one, appreciate what she's doing. Later on, I learned how to treat Parkinson's in uh, the Bahamas. I didn't know enough at the time. So I, I learned how to do it in about 2004, 2005. I could have made it much better, but that's life. You have to take with the good and the bad, and you have to do the best you can at any given time. At any rate, Rihanna was is one of my favorites nowadays. I learned a great deal in the Bahamas and the Caribbean. Can't always get everything right. <laughs> Hmm. 
Gave Ronnie Army the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> 